Good afternoon, everybody. How we doing? How we doing? Good to see you. Hey, welcome to the Institute for Church Leadership. My name is Andy, and I work here at Nebraska Christian College as the Director of Leadership Development. Really quick, I just want to uh, tell you uh, why we do this. You know, uh, there, there's a, a reason behind this craziness uh, we do here. And uh, we, we found a few years ago that we were trying to prepare ministry uh, students to lead in the local church, but uh, it, just uh, classroom education was not going to be enough, right? Am I right? Can I get an amen? Okay, thank you. So we said we're going to build a couple of things that help prepare them experientially. Uh, one of those things is a leadership classroom, you could say, what we call our ministry honors program, uh, at which those students then attend these events that we do probably about three times a semester nowadays. And so uh, days like this where we can have uh, high-level church leaders come talk to us about what it's like on a certain topic, what it's like to lead in the church today. So uh, that's why we're doing these, and we're so grateful you could join us. We just love uh, serving the local church. That's what we're all about. And so thanks for being here, and thanks for serving in a local church if you, or, or a nonprofit organization. Give yourselves a round of applause today for doing that. It's a big deal. It's a big deal, uh, so thanks for, thanks for doing that. I, I want to uh, mention along that note, especially to my students uh, that are in the room, uh, one of our uh, other things we did was build a residency program. So our students that are in ministry uh, serve 12 hours, uh, 12 credit hours worth uh, of, of service in a local church. So we give them 12 credits, uh, and they, they spend about 20 hours a week, their last four semesters in college, serving in a local church or nonprofit. Again, the experiential side of this deal. So... Um, Along that note, to my students, Discovery Church from Colorado is in town recruiting for residency. That's right. So, great church. So, they're in the cafe, and you should stop by afterwards. They've got additional desserts. We ran out of cookies, so, I mean, hey, why not go back and, and get something else from them, a gift bag, and talk to them about potentially serving in residency during your senior year out in Colorado. Uh, great church. So, talk, stop by and talk to them. Um, hey, we've got, uh, before, I, before I get into today, I want to talk about what's coming up. Tony uh, J. Collier will be here in a month. Exactly four uh, weeks from today, March 11th, building great teams. Uh, we, you know, if you've done ministry for any length of time, you know it, it matters that you build a great team, equip them, and, and uh, serve them well. So uh, you can come back here in a month and hear from Tony. I'm uh, building a winning team. Uh, Tony's from uh, North Point uh, Church in, in, uh, in Georgia there, so uh, doing a lot of production stuff, speaks to uh, high school, middle school, and, and, uh, and kids, and does a lot of video production, all this stuff. She's in, in a lot of uh, arenas, so... She's going to have some great uh, stories and, and things to talk about there. Looking forward to that. Then Carlos Whitaker is coming as well. Uh, uh, that's April 8th. And so uh, he has a, a unique story. Uh, many of you know Carlos. Uh, and he's going to be talking about his own, uh, I think, um, journey uh, emotionally and how to uh, get, get through not just uh, clear away the cobwebs, right, that, that, that come uh, with that emotional journey, but to actually kill the spider, if you follow me. Uh, so uh, that's what he's going to be talking about on April 8th, and that'll be the last one for this semester. So uh, be sure to sign up for either of those and come back. Love to have you. Speaking of Kill the Spider, uh, hit that book is available in the back for 10 bucks if you want to grab one of those, um, along with Caleb's books um, and uh, a few other of our speakers, former and upcoming. So be sure to stop by the book table, 10, 10 book, uh, bucks for most of those books. Tyler Reagan, president of Catalyst, was here earlier this year, and his book is 15. It was hardcover. I don't know. So you gotta, you got to go back and check that out. If you buy any two books today, including uh, Caleb Kaltenbach's two books, Messy Grace and God of Tomorrow, uh, if you buy any two books, including these two, uh, we're going to throw in uh, Carrie Newhoff's book, Didn't See It Coming. Uh, so, so feel free to swing by and grab a couple of books. Uh, we were able to get some advanced reader copies that he didn't need. Uh, so, you know, hey, why not? Uh, let's pass that along to you guys. So anyways, go back and grab some books um, anytime. Well, maybe not during. That'd be weird. But um, afterward would be fine, and he'll be back there too if you want him to sign or, or hang out and talk. So uh, cash, uh, check, or even card today. Uh, go see my friends in the back. They'll take care of you. Um, so, without further ado, let's, let's talk about Caleb Coltenbach. Caleb, uh, if you know him at all, has a unique story, uh, raised by uh, three gay parents, and uh, became, uh, long story short, came uh, into a relationship with the Lord and became a pastor uh, of a local church, and so uh, has, has been working towards this uh, idea of bridging the gap between the LGTB plus community and your church. Uh, that, that is the heartbeat of him. You have to know, too, though, that he's uh, really passionate about uh, Star Wars, 
Um, really passionate about, um, I mean, don't ask him about The Last Jedi. If you don't want to talk for a while, uh, don't, don't bring that up, okay? Uh, you, he likes Diet Coke a lot. Uh, you know, he's just a, a lot of fun, and he's got a great message. And uh, I'm really excited for this conversation to be happening today. Uh, and again, thanks for being here. But let's, if you don't know how we welcome people at the Institute, follow us, students lead. If you've been here before, let's do it. Give an Institute welcome to Caleb Kaltenbach. Wow. Love the music. You can definitely tell that's my style, right? That's how I roll. Hey, um, uh, it's just so great to be here. And yeah, don't ask me about the travesty that is The Last Jedi. That we're not going to talk about that. Anyway, um, hey, thank you so much for having me. Um, thanks to Andy. Uh, if, if, you are, if you're looking for a place to go, uh, my friend Steve Cuss is at Discovery in Colorado. He is a great dude. That would be a great church for you guys to partner up with. Um, if you are a church here and you're looking for a resident intern, um, somebody that you want to raise up and not abuse too much, um, this is a great place to look at. It's also a great place to send your students. So I hope that uh, you keep on coming here. My wife actually got her counseling degree from Hope International University uh, in December 2016. So we're, we're big fans. Um, <clears throat> anyway, you guys already kind of know my story. Uh, so I'm not going to talk that much about it because here's what I want to do. I want to get pretty practical and help you guys think through what does it look like to build a system or process within your church or your ministry setting that uh, allows belonging and allows LGBTQ people to attend and even get involved, but at the same time, guards your doctrine, guards your values, um, because I don't know about you, but I believe that people find and follow Jesus better in the midst of community, not in isolation and rejection. And so we're going to talk about that. And also, I just want to let you know a, an assumption that I'm going to make. And I know I probably shouldn't make this assumption, but we've got limited amount of time. So you're getting an assumption thrown at you. So, you know, forgive me ahead of time if you don't agree. Um, but I am making the assumption. I'm working from what I believe, and I'm making the assumption that the majority of people in here believe that God designed sexual intimacy for the expression of marriage between a man and a woman, okay? That's the assumption I'm making. I'm also making the assumption that you, like me, believe that theological convictions should never be catalysts to devalue other people. Um, that if anything, our theology and what we believe about Jesus should make us uh, pursue people all the more and love them all the more relentlessly because I think it was Paul in Romans 5, who said, while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. In other words, he's been pursuing uh, you and I since before we were born. And he has been pursuing the people uh, who are in same-sex relationships, people who identify in some way, shape, or form, uh, who are not following Jesus. You know, if they identify as LGBTQ, if they identify um, as a, a workaholic, if they identify, goodness forbid, as a Raiders fan, God... <laughs> is still, I'm a Chiefs fan, God is still pursuing them, okay? And if God is lovingly pursuing them, we need to as well. If God is intentional in his pursuit, we need to be intentional as well, okay? So these are the assumptions that I'm making. And I want to start off with a couple stories. One of them may perplex you, and I hope it does. Uh, the other one, I want to scare you, and I hope it does scare you. Okay, so I'll do the perplexing one first. I was working with a church last year up in Michigan and doing consulting. This is what I do full time. I help churches and Christian schools and um, uh, ministry organizations think through this and, and specifically with churches, helping them to set up these systems and processes at every level of the organization. So I was working with this church. It was a pretty good sized church in the Michigan area. And I won't say which one, but it was a pretty good sized church. And I was going uh, over a lot of the different problems and issues they were having, uh, you know, and, and I was meeting with their executive team and everything like that, and we were talking through things. And then they threw a problem at me that I wasn't expecting, which is fine, you know. But this specific problem had just happened about a week 
before I got there. And they're like, well, I don't know. Let's save it for Caleb. He likes fun. And so, <laughs> anyway, they, they had these two older married lesbian couples start attending their church. And both couples had adopted young children from the foster system in Michigan. And these kids had been tossed around from home to home. And some experiences not good, some experiences good. But now they were with, you know, these two couples. And um, they started attending the church, even though they knew what the church believed about same-sex relationships. Um, They went every Wednesday night, because that's when they had the children's programming, and they had some adult Bible studies there. Uh, They also went on Sunday morning. Um, They served in some limited places. And during that six months, the pastor um, did not preach on marriage or parenting, and that's not because uh, he didn't want to. They just hadn't got there in the sermon calendar. You know what I'm talking about. And so then, a week before I got there, one of the couples went up and cornered one of the staff people and said, we don't know what to do. And the staff member had been dreading this. And the staff member is like, oh, what, what, what should we do? Well, I don't know what they're going to ask. And here's what the couples asked. We now believe that marriage is between a man and a woman. But we are married. What should we do? And then they asked me that. And I said, I don't know, can we go to Buffalo Wild Wings? I mean, is that what we can do right now? Because at that time, nobody had ever asked me that. You know, and and then, you know, so I'll talk about that later on. But that's the first thing. That should perplex you. Because for some of you, you're like, well, I know exactly what they should do. You know what? I'm great. You know exactly what to do. You are obviously God's gift to wherever you are at, okay? Um... (laughs) And I know my theology, but when you start working in the trenches of people's lives, not so easy, right? I'm not saying it's, it's that they shouldn't do the right thing. I'm saying it's not so easy to start thinking about how to move there, especially when you have kids involved. Let me, let me tell you one that should scare you. I was working with a church, a large church in Virginia. And this church in Virginia, they, they had a great, great... Uh, ministry to the community. They were growing. A lot of people were involved there, but they really didn't have people in their family ministry staff. And if you work with family ministries, students or children, I'm sorry, I'm not trying to throw you under the bus. Okay, I'm sure you are more intentional than, than this church, but you know, come on. We all have seasons where we need volunteers, you know, and we're going to do that background check, you know, but if you smell like you'd be a good volunteer, you're in, you know. <laughs> We need you, especially with children and students and that kind of thing. You got to be careful, but we need you. And so they had two women who had been attending the church sign up. And, you know, they took them through their process, and it seemed on paper like they had a good process, but they kind of left some things out. And so then, a couple months later, they're looking and doing a mailing. They find out that these two women have the same address. Then they start asking around, oh yeah, they're married. They've been married for a while. And now they're small group leaders in their elementary age environment, in their elementary age ministry. What do they do? So a couple of the staff went and met with the two ladies and said, which don't ever, ever say this, and we'll talk about this later on. They met with these two ladies. They said, I'm, I'm sorry, we love you guys, but you can't serve here because you're gay. Said, wow, okay. Thanks for that, right? I know this is going to be a complete shock to you, but those ladies left the church. Can you imagine? Okay? And and not only did that happen, that started a ripple. Because, you see, the kids loved them. They were great small group leaders. And then the kids were upset that, that they're no longer their small group leaders. The kids' parents started asking questions. Some of them were upset of how the church handled this. They left the church. And then some of the volunteers that were working with these two ladies in the children's ministry found out about how they were treated. They left the church. Then, again, hard to believe, gossip started happening in the church. I know that doesn't happen in your churches. Um, it doesn't mine, unfortunately. I just, I stay in the periphery. I'm a wallflower. Anyway. So you have people in the, in the church that start getting upset. And then this church that had this great reputation in the community. Now they're known as the anti-gay church. Which, to be honest, it couldn't be further from the truth. They are not. But guess what? 
not being intentional, not handling what's going, what, you know, something like this. It may seem like a small thing, but not being intentional with having a process, making sure everybody's in alignment with following it, and not having the right kind of conversation, and not being intentional has ruined the image that they have in their community. Because many of you know this, and, and I talked with some students this morning about this, but listen, you all have heard the fact that once you lose trust, it's hard to rebuild, right? Well, guess what? When somebody has a perspective of you, that is hard to reframe. Just as hard as trust is to build, it is hard to reframe perspective. And the perspective that somebody else may have of your ministry or your church or your school, it may not be the truth, but it is definitely that person's reality. Okay? So here's what I, what I want you to do. I want to help you move forward. And I'll talk to you at the end about both these stories and kind of bring some resolution there. The first and foremost thing I want to say is this, as we start out, and I got to go quickly here because I do want to leave time for Q&A, let you guys ask some questions, and then I'll be up here afterwards if you guys want to come up and ask questions. Um, And if your question is too hard, I will give you Andy's personal cell phone number, (laughs) and he loves difficult questions. So yeah, please, ask away. Anyway, first thing I want to say is this, is that many people think that the biggest issue, when somebody's in a same-sex relationship or somebody identifies as LGBTQ, many people think that that automatically means that they're in a same-sex relationship. That's not true. There are several people, several Christian leaders that I know, that you know as well, um, that are same-sex attracted and in some way may see themselves or relate with LGBTQ But at the same time, they're celibate out of their biblical convictions, okay? Jackie Hill Perry is one. Sam Alberry, if you have Right Now Media, we did Messy Grace small group video curriculum where all these people shared their testimonies, and you should check that out. But, like, these are two examples. Wesley Hill, who wrote Spiritual Friendship, talking about how we live in a society that's sex crazed, therefore we think sexual intimacy is like the peak of intimacy. And his whole book is, and I give it to heterosexual single people, his whole book, Spiritual Friendship, is all about how you can pursue intimacy with people that's, dip, that's deeper and is not sexual. The intimacy is experienced in so many different ways. Okay? Many of us think that that automatically means they're in a relationship. That, that's not true. Many people are, are concerned. There are people who are same-sex attracted who fell in love with somebody of the opposite sex. They had emotional feelings for them. Then that translated into physical feelings, and they're attracted to their spouse, but they're still same-sex attracted. So we need to be careful and intentional in not making assumptions. This is why questions are so important. Right? Many Christian leaders... Like, do not know how to ask a really good question. If you want to get better at being a leader and, and really within this conversation, learn how to ask a good question, okay? But that's one thing that we need to understand. Not everybody identifies in the same way. Second thing is this. The biggest issue with people who are in, in same-sex relationships are really, really, really relate and see themselves mainly as part of the LGBTQ community where that would be their primary community The average straight person thinks that that's because they want to have sex with people of the same gender. And that is not true. I mean, sexual sin is an issue. But guess what? Look look at all the people around you. It's going to be creepy after I have you look around. But look at all the people around you, okay? Every person you see here is sexually broken. Every single one of you. Okay, so, so is, is sexual sin, sexual brokenness a part of it? Absolutely it is. But you know what the biggest issue is? It's identity. People who really relate as LGBTQ, it's an identity issue. I was working with um, a, a group of Assemblies of God uh, denominational leaders not too long ago. And I was sitting down with them. And I had a, a guy there you know, who's like, well, I just don't see how this is any different than adultery. We need to preach like John the Baptist. And blah, blah. I wanted to tell him, you know, you kind of dress like John the Baptist, but I didn't because, you know, I, be, 
I'm a Christian, at least in that moment I was. But here's what, here's what I could, here's, I looked at him and I said, it is absolutely an identity issue. I said, I can prove it. I said, I asked him, have you ever known anybody that's committed adultery? He's like, oh yeah. Okay, within the first five or ten minutes when you meet somebody, do they tell you, I'm an adulterer. That's what I do. I adult. <laughs> wherever I can, right? No, you haven't. But how many people have you met and within, you know, a few minutes of the conversation or later on, they're like, I'm gay. I'm a lesbian. I'm transgender. You know, I'm cis. I'm binary. Whatever you want to say. I mean, how many people have done that? You see, right there, it is an identity issue. And by the way, ever since Genesis chapter 3, humanity has had an identity issue. Okay? We were originally made in the image of God. However you believe that God created the earth, we were made in the image of God, we fell away, and ever since we fell away, we have had an identity issue where we are trying to identify with everything else. And when Satan tempted Adam and Eve, I mean, what did Satan do? Satan said, hey... You will be like God. Notice that. Satan's trying to get them to repeat the same sin that he pulled in heaven, trying to unseat God and put himself there. And we spend the rest of our lives fighting and struggling as Christians to keep Jesus on the throne of our life. This is primarily an identity issue. It is a subculture, just like Christianity is a subculture, you know, both have their own books, both have their own speakers, both have their own comedians, both have their own breath mints, believe it or not. Both, at the same time, you know, they have their apologists, they have their magazines, movies. We have more in common with the LGBTQ community than what we know. The last thing I'll say is this before we move on, because it's an identity issue, and understand this, not everybody who is in a same-sex relationship, not everybody who is transgender or same-sex attracted, sees themselves as part of the LGBTQ community. And I feel like almost now, in an, in a, in an age where we live in, a, in, a, in an age of false dichotomies, where you're either an extremist on this side or that side, I feel like there's the big temptation to say, okay, somebody's in a same-sex relationship, that means they're like, you know, they're like the extremists. Not really. Guess what? The majority of people I know in same-sex relationships or who are transgender are just as frustrated with the extremists as I am and as you would be. They're just as frustrated with the government. And guess what? There are many LGBTQ people who attend churches that do not agree with their relationship, but they still attend because they feel valued. That's extremely important for you to understand. Okay? So we have to be intentional. Some of you might be saying, Caleb, why should we be intentional? We have to be intentional because if this is primarily an identity issue, and if we are not intentional in how we handle identity issues, we will unintentionally bring shame to people. And shame is dangerous. Shame, you know, guilt says, I've done something wrong. Shame says, I am something wrong. And so, we have to be very careful and intentional on how we deal with it. And I've had people say, well, Caleb, I just, I don't agree with that. I don't think, you know, we need to be intentional at all and everything like that. You know, like that one guy, we need to preach like John the Baptist. No, well, you're not him. He had a special calling. Things didn't turn out well for him, by the way, either. <laughs> but we see the same kind of level of intentionality in the life of Jesus, in the life of Paul, right? I mean, Jesus, notice that he shared the gospel one way with Nicodemus in John 3. He shared it a different way, a different approach with the woman at the well, right? Different, same gospel. Look at Apostle Paul. What about 1 Corinthians 9, 19 through 23, where he says, I have become all things to all people. Why? He's not a multiple personality. He's doing it because he wants to win some because God gets the most glory when people far from him become followers of him. And we see that in Philippians 2, 9 through 10. I mean, notice how Paul preaches one way in Acts 17 to the philosophers in Athens, but then a different way to the Jewish people in Jerusalem to Festus and Agrippa. Why? 
Because he was dealing with two different sets of people. Or, I mean, several different sets of people. I think that if Paul preached Acts 17 today, there would be people, again, not in this room, we got it together, but there would be other people who are Christian leaders who would say, well, that's seeker sensitive. He doesn't even get to God or Jesus till the end of the sermon. People today would be like, I don't, that's just, that's just reprehensible. No, it's not. There's a difference between reprehensible and strategic. There's a difference between intentionality and just saying, well, this is how I do things and you've got to get used to it. Okay, that's great. You know, we'll see you in heaven, but let's stay over there. I'll be here. We'll hang out in heaven. Well, here's the other thing. There's also intentionality that we see in 1 Corinthians 14 where the Apostle Paul speaks about tongues. Have you ever looked at 1 Corinthians 14, 16 through 17, and 23 through 24? Where Paul says, hey, if you're speaking in tongues, when the whole church gathers, and you're speaking in tongues, and you don't have an interpreter, don't do it. Paul says, because if an unbeliever is there amongst you, will they not think that you are out of your mind? Do you notice that even in the first century, Paul says, you need to be intentional about what your worship service looks like because unbelievers are in your midst. I heard a, a famous Christian leader the other day, I'm not going to say who, they said this, and this is my own opinion, I think I'm mostly right, but my wife disagrees. She's, it's a whole other sermon. Never mind. We're not going to go into that. I love my wife. She is beautiful. She is tan. She is tall. Like, she goes to the gym every day. Shocker, I don't. She is a muy caliente Latina. And in her wildest imagination, she had no clue that her knight in shining armor would look like a cross between Fester Gru and Dr. Evil. I mean... <laughs> This is her eye candy every morning. She's a lucky, lucky lady. But I heard this Christian leader, this Christian leader said, well, you know, the church is for Christians. False. The church is made up of Christians to equip Christians to make disciples, which means seeking and saving the lost, the unchurched, the de-churched, the unbelievers, to the glory of God. The church is for God. At least that's what I get from the end of Revelation when Jesus and the church get married, right? And so I see that, and it's like, wow, even back then. And it would make sense for unbelievers to be in the early church. You had so many married couples that were, one was this a believer, the other one wasn't. They probably took turns meeting each other's houses. Unbelievers probably went with their married spouse. I think that's one of the reasons why Paul had to write 1 Corinthians 7. If you're married to an unbeliever, and the unbeliever leaves. Because I think that was the culture back then. So we see this level of intentionality. But we struggle with it. We shouldn't. There are many reasons why, and, I know, and I'm sure you probably know why. Um, but here's the deal. We have to learn that there is a big difference between acceptance and agreement or acceptance and approval, acceptance and affirmation. There's a huge difference. You know, acceptance, I think, is commanded by God. Agreement is optional. Acceptance, let me define this, Caleb definition, acceptance is loving people, no matter who they are, no matter where they are, no matter what they've done, we're commanded to love them, right? John says that all over, First John. You know, what about, what about uh, Matthew 5, 38 through 48? Especially Matthew 5, verse 46. If you only love those who love you, what reward will you get? What about Romans 2, 4, where the Apostle Paul says, um, don't you know that it is... Uh, what did he say? <laughs> oh, yeah, I remember now. Sorry, it's been a long day. Don't you know that it's the kindness of God that has led you to repentance? And, like, if God's kindness led me to repentance, shouldn't my kindness lead people to God? What about Romans 12, 9 through 18, especially verse 18, where the Apostle Paul says, um, 
as much as it depends on, on you, live at peace with everyone. What about Romans 13, 8 through 10, where Paul says, we don't owe any ch- other people anything except the duty to love one another. Whoever has loved his or her neighbor has kept the law. You see, acceptance is loving people no matter what. And love and peace with another person depends on me, not them. Because God holds me accountable for how I manage my reactions and my emotions, how I develop and grow my character and integrity, how I grow my faith in conjunction with the Holy Spirit. You know, good, good news, bad news. He's never held me accountable for somebody else and their emotions and reactions. Okay? Bad news, he has never held me accountable for anyone else. That means I can't blame. I'm a good blamer, by the way. I love to blame. You guys love to blame? Of course you do. You're human. Come on. Tell the truth. Shame the devil. You see, we have to understand the difference between acceptance and agreement. Acceptance is paramount. Real, authentic love is built on acceptance. Cheap love is built on agreement. I'm willing to bet you have people in your lives that you accept, you love, you hang out with, but you do not agree with every decision they've made, that kind of a thing, right? And by the way, when I say decision, I'm not saying that being same-sex attracted is a decision, because I don't think it is. At least where I live in Los Angeles, there is a culture in our churches where it's trendy in some way, shape, or form within middle school and high schools to identify as LGBTQ in some way. And I think that's a trend for right now. But I, I, I don't know, I mean, that people are, are born this way, but I do believe that people really don't have control over whether or not they're same-sex attracted. And so people ask me, Caleb, you know, what if you're born that way? You know, and, and I answer this nicer than what I'm going to say right now because I, I try to be empathetic and love people. But really, I don't care. I mean, Plato said, be kind. Everybody you meet is fighting a difficult battle you know nothing of. You see, Christianity has never been about a birthright. It has always been about a biblical worldview. You you are not grandfathered in because of what family you're born into or anything like that. Okay? You don't, how you're born doesn't matter as much as the sacrifices you make. You see, I think we should make it easy for people to find Jesus because he is hard to follow sometimes. If you don't believe me, try driving in L.A. on a daily basis. There have been times I've checked my Christianity right at the door. Somebody cuts me off. I'm like, bless you. (laughs) Right? Christianity is about sacrifice, and we need to ask the question. We're not going to handle this today, but we need to ask the question. If somebody who is same-sex attracted decides to be celibate out of their biblical conviction, I think it is incumbent upon us as Christians and the church they attend to become their family, to offer them belonging, and to figure out what does it mean to help them carry a difficult burden for the rest of their lives. Because this is an identity issue, the biggest thing that people fear is loneliness. That's why I think we should offer people belonging. And I'm not saying belonging into salvation. I'm saying that we need to create a place for people and be intentional about it so that they, it will be easier for them to belong to the Father one day and to make that decision. Okay? So, what does that look like? How do we do that? How can we create a system? First of all, you have to do this. You have to decide when it comes, and I'm just specifically talking about LGBTQ plus here. I'm not you know, talking about other things, so keep that in mind. But you have to specifically decide where do you see misalignment when it comes to your values, when it comes to your doctrinal statement, where do you see misalignment? Because we've got to create places for people to belong. People will never mainly identify with the church as their community, their primary community, if they don't feel safe. They'll never leave this community or primarily, you know, identify with the church community if they don't have a chance to, you know, uh, try it out. And so I think that we have to uh, give them opportunities to invite people, right? Absolutely. 
It should be, it should be a, a huge uh, compliment to you if you have LGBTQ people who are inviting people to your church. Okay? I, I think that we need to give them opportunities to give, right? You're like, amen and amen. I knew God gave you that word right there. I mean, you know? I mean, if somebody doesn't go to our church and they want to give, I'm like, oh, yes, I'll pray for you. Yes, thank you. Right? We need to give people opportunities to be able to connect and join small groups and Bible studies. But here's the big deal. What about serving? You see, I'm willing to bet that you're kind of like me. I'm willing to bet that for those of you who are in full-time, part-time Christian leadership of some sort, or maybe you're a leader in the church, but you work elsewhere, um, here's the deal. I'm willing to bet that the serving question is probably the biggest one, right? Because it's like, We have to create room. I mean, Paul was intentional about unbelievers. How much more intentional should we be about other people who identify as LGBTQ and are in same-sex relationships? And we don't want anybody to feel like second-class citizens. So I think we have to have places in our church where people can serve and get involved in even if they don't believe in God. You know, my main mentor is a guy I've known since I was in college, um, uh, when I was a sophomore, uh, he pastors a good-sized church in Las Vegas. And they kind of led the way after the MGM shooting. Remember that? In the fall of 2017? And then there were so many families of victims who lived in the Las Vegas area who needed things done. And so they organized a lot of their small groups, their community groups, their life groups, cell groups, whatever you want to call them, to go out and to serve people. And they had people from the community who didn't even attend their church or weren't Christian start joining these groups so they could go out and actually serve and get involved and help people. And almost every single unbeliever that did that became a Christian and is now attending this church as a result. Because, you see, serving is not just something that is a duty. In a Me Too culture, in a culture that is so focused on justice, serving is a new way of engaging unchurched people and unbelievers. And so, as I said before, you got to figure out within the acronym of LGBTQ, thinking through that, where do you have the biggest problem? Like, where is their misalignment? Okay, for me, it would be two things. Those who are in intimate same-sex relationships and those who, um, uh, whose theology says that anybody can marry anyone. If their theology doesn't align with... Uh, what we see in, as the traditional marriage in Scripture, and it's not just you know, what you know, Genesis says. Matt, Jesus, when talking about divorce, leverages Genesis 1.27 and 2.24 to define marriage in Matthew 19. Some people will say, well, Jesus didn't say anything about homosexuality. He said a lot about the male-female relationship, and he said a lot about purity, by the way. And so you've got to figure out where in your organization, where do you have a difficult time with where's their misalignment and wherever there's misalignment there you have to have conversations with people okay that that's a huge portion of this you have got to be having consistent conversations at the leadership level but also with people in your church who identify as lgbtq and not just tough holy living conversations but asking questions listening getting to know them And as you start having these conversations and so on and start listening to them and you figure out where in your church, I mean, where you have a problem with, like where there's misalignment, where somebody might be identifying as LGBTQ, after that, you need to decide how do we place a boundary somewhere? How do we create a filter? How do we uh, create a system where anybody can belong, where anybody can gather, and where anybody can serve, but... I mean, not everyone can serve anywhere, right? Not everyone can serve in children's ministries. Hopefully, even if they pass the background check, I always told my staff, if they pass pass the background check, and if you kind of like, you're like, there's something, I get a weird feeling, say no, feel free to refuse. Like, my wife is great at character. I'm not. She can read people like nothing else. She's like, you know, Caleb, I think you need to be careful with that person. I said, now you're being all judgy, judgy. You need to be like Jesus and love people, Amy. And then it turns out that she's right. God bless her. She doesn't say, I told you so. 
But we need to pay attention to our gut feelings, and we need to use a filter, some kind of a system that defines where people can serve, where that line is drawn. Some churches do it different ways. Some churches have green light, red light, yellow light. Like green light is anyone can serve here no matter what. Yellow light is this takes some conversation. Red light is, you know, who knows? You know, red light is you can't serve here and we're going to have, have to have a really difficult conversation. Some people have different levels. They'll have level one, two, three, four, and five. And depending on where you are within the church, and that's insider language. Don't say that to other people. That's just for staff and leaders to understand. You know, you can pretty much serve anywhere at level one, but you go all the way up to level four or five, and that's very, very specialized. And there are some boundaries there. Okay? Here's what boundaries should have. Here's what it looks like to, when you create a system. Number one, whatever filter, whatever boundary, whatever system you create, number one, needs to guard the integrity of everyone involved. It needs to guard the integrity of the potential volunteers. It needs to guard the integrity of the church. Think about the illustration that I told you about the two ladies who are serving. Right? They, they started serving. Okay? The church compromised their integrity by not being intentional. Like their own integrity, the church compromised its own integrity, but the church also compromised their integrity. Because who knows... What the, what the ladies, I'm sure, you know, I didn't meet these ladies, but I would hope that they would teach what was in the lesson, but now they're in a position where when it comes to uh, marriage, they have to either teach what the church believes, even though they don't believe it, so that compromises their character, or they have to teach what they believe, you know, instead of what the church believes, and that compromises their character, Right? I mean, you probably already know this, but as a leader in a church or a ministry, you are 100% responsible for protecting the character and integrity of those involved. Number two is provide clarity to all those who are involved. Number three is to redirect potential volunteers to where they can serve. Number four is to prioritize conversations. And number five is to affirm and move the volunteer closer to Jesus. Like one way we did it in the church I served at, we used the word leader as a filter. Leader when it comes to anything having to do with worship or teaching. So we would count small groups in that. We would not count the head of guest services in that. We would count worship leader, elementary age worship leader, um, you know, like preschool small group leader, high school small group leader, high school, middle school worship leader as that. But we would not count somebody in the tech booth or something like that. Leader is the filter that we used. I don't think that's necessarily the best one. I've got some other ideas I can't share right now because I don't have time. And I'm already cutting into a little bit of Q&A time, but that's fine. Um... Honestly, it was good, and it was easy to remember. Leader having to do with worship or teaching. But then it's like, you have to have a conversation with them. You have to have a conversation where you provide the clarity, like I said in number two. Where you redirect them, you affirm them. You know, and and you let them know you're guarding their integrity. So what does that look like? Well, there were two... um, uh, 20-something um, uh, young lesbians who were in our church who had gotten married, and one of them had a child from a previous marriage. And they were in my small group. I knew them pretty well. And they were in my small group, and we had been talking about things, and they had been asking questions like, you know, I'm not sure if we should still be married or not. And I was trying to lead them gently through that conversation. But then we had a volunteer Sunday where everybody signed up. And they signed up to serve as an elementary age leader, a small group leader for their kids' first grade Sunday school class. And first of all, don't you wish that more parents who put their kids in student ministry or children's ministry would actually serve? Some of you are like, yes, the majority, these people, no, but yes, right? And so, like, 
I, I, I just was not looking forward to it. It feels easier to have this conversation with somebody you don't know and really don't care deeply about. So I, I sat down with them and our family life director, and I said, I said, listen, I said, in our church, you know, we believe that God designed sexual intimacy for the expression of marriage between one man and one woman. And we get this, we start where Jesus talked about it in Matthew 19. And I, I told them, even if you don't believe that Genesis 1 through 3 is history, even if you think that's metaphor, those writings are still representative of the earliest of the Israelite community's understanding of marriage, relationship, and sexuality. And I said, you know, we teach that from birth all the way through the grave. And I said, you know, we, that, that, is a, that is a big cornerstone that we see within most families, not all, but most. And I, I said, obviously, this is not your theological conviction. Okay? I said, you guys have the character to do this. You, you do what you say you're going to do. You show up on time. Okay? You understand our church's DNA and vision. Okay? You are personality plus. Okay? You, you are willing to sacrifice. We love all these things. You have the chops to be able to do it. But in this area, we need 100% belief agreement. If you were trying out for the worship team, we would need you to be able to play or sing well. For this area, we need 100% theological agreement. And obviously, this is not your theological conviction. So I would hate to put you in a situation where you were forced to teach something you didn't believe in and compromise your own character. I would rather help you find a place in the church to serve where you weren't compromising your integrity. And most of the time, that conversation went well. Some of the times it didn't. When it didn't go well, it was because somebody was really new to our church and they hadn't been bought in. Some of the times it didn't go well because somebody just had an ax to grind. And I'm, I'm not interested in debating. If I want that, I'll go post something on Facebook. <laughs> and so, you know, I mean, this also led to, you know, discussions about holy living at times. But by this time... When these people who were trying out our church, who had been coming for a little bit, they felt valued and loved by the people in our church, and so our words carried weight. Our investments built influence. I'm not talking about people that are already engaged and they get caught doing something. That's different. I'm talking about creating enough margin for people to sit in rows and gather in circles to be able to um, you know, hear about the grace of God and have God do spiritual heart surgery in their lives. So, let me tell you the conclusions of those first two stories. The first one with the two couples, um, one of the elders, when they told me about this, we, unfortunately, they didn't take me up on going to Buffalo Wild Wings um, so that I could go home and study and pray. Um, I, I just thought to myself, I got to ask questions because I don't know what to do. And when I don't know what's going on or when I feel uncomfortable, I'm just going to start asking questions and try to make them non-threatening questions. But I, I didn't have to because one elder who was in the meeting said, well, I just think they should get divorced. And I was like, oh, thank you. He set up the runway. I love him. I'm not going to smash him too hard, but, you know. And I said, okay. I, I said, listen, I believe that marriage is between a man and a woman. And I'm not saying that you're wrong, but I'm saying that I think we need to talk about this because no matter the situation, divorce is icky. And then I said, what about the kids? You, wanna, you want them to divorce. And so, the, you know, if, if you work with youth, students, kids, that kind of thing, you understand that one of the most powerful things in a student's life is consistency. And that's why, with, whether it's children's ministry or youth ministry, you want consistent volunteers in small groups, right? Because as a child gets older, their parents' influence drops but small group leaders and their volunteers, their influence goes up, right? And I said, so they've had consistency. Now you want to put them in a situation where they're going back and forth between two homes. I said, again, I'm not saying that they shouldn't do that. I'm just saying, can't we at least pause and talk about that? 
And so I helped them create like three solutions or something like that. And I said, don't tell them what to do. Offer them like here are three suggestions and then walk with them. And so the couple, uh, they were no longer sexually intimate, both couples. Especially with with lesbian couples, um, you know, a lot that I know, not all, but like a lot as they get older, they're not sexually intimate anymore. It's not like male relationships. This is not always the case, but I found it to be a lot because it's about the emotional bond. And so here's what the, couple, the two couples decided to do. They got divorced, but because um, sexual temptation was not an issue, they continued living together as roommates and raising the kids together to provide consistency. And now the church sends whenever... Um, LGBTQ people come and have questions, the church utilizes both of these couples to help them understand. Now, last time I checked there, both couples were still going on Wednesday nights and Sunday mornings. With the church in Virginia, it's a slow heal. But being very, very intentional of loving people, being very intentional of doing good acts in the community, being intentional about Uh, words you use has really gone a long way. They still have a big trek to go to reframe their perspective, but, you know, I think God can do anything. He parted the Red Sea. He forgave David. I mean, look at that guy. That guy invented new sins. I think God can do anything with anyone. So, anyway, I'm going to stop there. I'm going to open it up for some questions. Um, Andy, somebody has a microphone Um, Just raise your hand, like I said. We only have time for probably two or three. um, And I'll be here afterwards. And also, my website is messygracegroup.org. Messygracegroup.org. And um, you can contact me on there. My email is also pretty easy. It's just caleb at messygracegroup.org. If I can help you guys out with anything, um, at your churches, your ministries, help you think through things, I'll do that in a heartbeat. So, questions? Yeah, I, I can't. Yeah, okay. Um, with the, what you were talking about earlier with we can accept people without agreeing with them, how do we um, as individuals, if we don't agree, how do we self-check to make sure that we're not looking at people as projects or something to fix? Hmm. I'd say a few different things. Number one, have consistent conversations. Are you saying within a church leadership perspective or are you saying just in everyday life? Everyday life. Okay, that's different. Um, In everyday life, you need to give permission to other people to speak into your life. If there are other people that do not have permission to speak into your life, eventually you will sabotage yourself. The other thing I would say is this. Um, You will be a much, and I'm not saying you're not gracious and humble, I just want to make that disclaimer. But you will be, everyone will be much more generous, loving, and humble if we repent on a daily basis. I think there's a reason in Matthew 6, 12, during the Lord's Prayer, where Jesus said, forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. I think that repentance is a spiritual discipline. I found, I, I try to repent every day. I have a little prayer I say. I don't do it every day. If I told you I did, I'd have to repent of that. Um, and it's not beating yourself up repentance. It's kind of like a heart cleanse. And, and I found that as I get better at repenting, I get better at forgiving. As I get better at repenting and forgiving, I become more gracious. I become more merciful. I become more humble. And here's the other thing I would, I would suggest you do. If, if, you, if anyone has a problem with, um, you know, accepting people that disagree with you. Number one, uh, if you see acceptance and agreement as the same thing, then that means you have a spiritual idol somewhere in your heart that you're protecting, okay? Jesus hung out with people all the time he didn't agree with. Jesus told first century Jewish people to walk the extra mile when Roman citizens would force them to carry their pack for a mile. Jesus said, you know the the people that abused your, 
your, your people that killed your brethren, that overtook your land, that's an occupying force led by a brutal dictator that thinks he's God, um, limits your religion, religion, imposes an illegal tax in your eyes. Um, you're supposed to go one mile with them. I want you to carry their pack another mile. Now, I don't think for a second that Jesus was saying, everything's okay, but they did his fine. No, Jesus is saying, mile one is about obligation, mile two is about the relationship. The more you repent, the more you forgive, the more you guard your time with God, the closer you'll get to coming to the end of yourself. Like our friend John the Baptist said in John 3.30, I must become more, he must... Oh, sorry, that is not what he said. Freudian slip. <laughs> Put that on the repent list, and some of you with that. So, um, I'm just kidding. So, John the Baptist said, I must become less, he must become more. I would say do those things. It, I mean... You, if you have, I think, okay, well, if you don't, you come up and say hi afterwards, okay? Okay. He has a question if nobody else does. Um, you were talking earlier about how some leadership positions need to have 100% theological agreement. Are you saying 100% theological agreement in every area? Because there's a lot of theological things that people disagree on. Or are there specific ones that they have to have theological agreement on? I think that's up to the organization, but I can tell you this, that when somebody is in a position of, of teaching or leading worship or something like that in a, a church organization or a ministry organization, part of that is communicating not only the values and not only living out the mission statement of the organization, Part of that is also representing the doctrine well. I'm not saying, I mean, because, listen, we, we all have areas that we disagree on. I mean, hopefully on your staff you have areas where people disagree on, but whatever are your core doctrinal statements, that is basically what people are, in teaching positions, are um, representing. Volunteer or paid. And I think this would apply to staff as well. Volunteer or paid. And so, um, you know, if marriage is one of those, will you say, yes, we define marriage as, you know, being between a man and a woman. I'm, I'm not even saying you have to have that on your website. I wouldn't, personally, because that's going to close the door of some people attending your church. They're going to automatically assume things about you. But if that is in, your, in something that you believe in, if it's somewhere in your staff handbook or your policy or something like that, whoever is a leader must represent that well. Because otherwise, uh, whether you use your own children's curriculum, for instance, or Lifeway, or Orange, I love Orange, you know, we use that. Uh, maybe you use uh, whatever curriculum, okay? Marriage is eventually going to come up, and uh, all those organizations would define, uh, you know, God's creation of sexual intimacy as being between a man and a woman, and reserved for marriage. And so putting somebody in a position, a teaching position, where they would compromise something that you're teaching on a regular basis, I mean, that, that, that's a big problem. You know what I mean? Other, I think we have time for one more. And I, I just really can't see. So if you have a microphone, just like, um, you know, there you go. So a question that I've always been, like, kind of curious oh. about and kind of conflicted on is, like, what do you think about transgender people and, like, they have their pronouns that they prefer like, how do you approach that? Do you use those pronouns, or do you, like, not? Um, I, think, I think Jordan Peterson has a good perspective on this. I don't know if he's a Christian or not, but I like his perspective. Um, he has a great book out called The Twelve Rules. Um, Twelve Rules, Ando, Precatic Living, I don't know, blah, blah. Um, it's, I'm reading it now. It's really good. I just can't remember the rest of the title because it's long. Um, but, you know, in Toronto, they mandated that, he, that people had to use the pronouns that um, anyone wanted them to use. So if I told you these are my pronouns, you had to use it or you're breaking the law. He refused and he said no. And he had to go stand before some kind of city magistrate or something like that. And, you know, when he did, they said, so you're just going to disrespect people. He's like, no. I he said, I teach clinical psychology at the University of Toronto. He said, 
if when I've had students in class that have asked me to call them by pronouns, you know, I do it. But the mere fact that you have now legislated language, I will not do it because I have to stand up for freedom of speech. And they ask, well, why would you do it, you know, for people that ask? He's like, because I don't want to be rude. And so I think there's a, there's a level where, you know, rudeness, we, we are rude if we don't acknowledge somebody's reality. If you use somebody else's pronouns, it doesn't mean that you agree with them. And this is a debatable issue. There are arguments for both sides. I'm just going to tell you my personal opinion, okay? Using somebody else's pronouns is not necessarily compromising. And, and again, there could be arguments where it could, but my personal opinion is it isn't because, again, what kind of influence do you want to have in a person's life? There's a difference between acknowledging what a person views as their reality so that you can inspire them to the ideal. Okay? Here's the other thing. Here's a question I'll ask. And I ask the same question of uh, people who say, should I attend a same-sex wedding or not? I I'll ask two questions. Number one, if you don't attend this wedding, or in your case, sir, when you asked about the pronouns, if you don't use these pronouns, will it make your relationship with that individual worse? Will it make it bad? In most cases, I think we can all agree, the answer is yes. And in that case, when it gets worse, your words will not matter that much to them. So I'll ask parents and other people this question. What would you be willing to do to keep or build influence in the life of your child? How far would you be willing to go to keep or build influence in the life of somebody you care about? What would it take? How far would you be willing to go so that you earn the right to be one of the first texts or phone calls they make when life happens and drama ensues and they feel hurt, don't you want to earn the right to be the first person they call? To be the person that, that says they know you care enough, even if you don't agree with them, to say, this person has always loved me. They text or call you and they say, I don't know what to do. Let me tell you something. If that's my son or daughter, as Craig Rochelle says, I'm willing to do just about anything short of sinning to earn the right to influence them to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so, again, some people say, you don't think we should have holy conversations, like conversations on holy living. I absolutely do, 100%. But I think we should be in a position where they know we care enough and our words carry weight. And usually in those seasons when people are the most broken, they're the most open to listening. They're the most open to what you have to say. Um, if you want to understand more about uh, gender dysphoria, and I'll close with this, um, there's a great author, Dr. Mark Yarhouse, Y-A-R-H-O-U-S-E. Um, he is a, a, a Christian a clinical psychologist and university professor at Regent University in Virginia Beach. Although he's moving and um, next and this coming fall he'll be a professor at Wheaton College in Chicago. Uh, he has a good conservative theology. He is probably the the uh, one of the leading, if not the leading, evangelical academic expert on the theology and psychology of sexuality. Um, he has a great book out called Understanding Gender Dysphoria. You, this needs to be on your bookshelf or in your Kindle or whatever. Understanding Gender Dysphoria. Um, he's very gracious. He's very kind. He's very loving. But he also represents the gospel law. So let me, let me pray for you, and uh, then I'll tell you what's coming next. Okay, Lord, thank you so much for this time. Thank you for the things we're able to talk about. Thank you for your son, um, and I know these are uncomfortable situations, and I know it's tense, but Father, you want us to live in the tension of grace and truth, just as your Son came full of both grace and truth. The Father, our faith is perfected in the struggle, not in our own performance. 
in a world of false dichotomies, help us use tension as a bridge. In a world where society is pointing them continually away from Jesus. Help us live out what you said in John 13, that they may know we are Christians by our love for one another. Let us be okay with being criticized. Your son was all the time. Help us, Father God, to not give up on this. It's in your son's name I pray. Amen. Guys, I really appreciate you. I'll be over here afterwards. Um, And uh, right now, I want to um, introduce you to the eloquent, studly Andy Dykehouse. Let's thank Kayla for being here. Appreciate that. Just real quick, as you're, as you're leaving, uh, feel free to stop by the book table. Uh, join us again in a month with Tony. Um, be careful. It's, uh, I'm sure it's getting slick out there and, and the snow is coming down, so enjoy that. You've had some practice recently. I assume you're good to go. Uh, and please, I know you came because you care about this conversation. Find ways to continue this conversation in your organization. We'll see you soon. Thanks for coming. <laughs>